This podcast and the following message are brought to you by Acorns, Grow Your Oak. Acorns helps you grow your money. In under five minutes, get investment accounts for you and your family, plus retirement, checking, ways to earn more money, and grow your knowledge. Take control with all-in-one investment, retirement, checking, and more. Just one dollar. $3 $3 or $5 a month. Find out more by going to autoconverse.com slash acorns. That's www.autoconverse.com forward slash acorns. From acorns, mighty oaks do grow. We all know that electric cars will save the world, right? Well, not so fast. The electric car industry is worth $170 billion today, and it'll grow to almost a trillion a year by 2030. It's an industry that claims to be driven by good intentions, but underneath, it's powered by greed, lies, and deception. And while Elon Musk is praised as a savior to the environmental movement, in reality, his industry has blood on its hands because it knowingly supports environmental destruction, as well as child labor and economic slavery. But these facts are often hidden or pushed to the side so that makers of electric cars can continue to make an insane amount of money. Basically, the idea that electric cars are zero emission or even good for the environment is a whole lot of bullshit. That was Sorel Amore, Australia-based YouTuber, entrepreneur, and published author, explaining her view of electric cars and what she calls the zero emission scam. Her take is that electric cars have the potential to be better for the environment, but that all depends on from where the energy to power the electric vehicles comes. Plus, as she explains, the natural resources required to make EVs are also a detrimental factor to the environment. Miss Amore is not the only one who is suspect about the narrative we are being fed about electric vehicles and saving the planet. A quick look on YouTube will reveal numerous such videos on the subject. But that doesn't mean EVs cannot be good for the planet. It just means we need to be honest about how they can be good for the planet. And it means we need to be honest about who is profiting from the false narrative that EVs are necessary to save the planet. From Autoburst Media, this is Autoconverse. Hey, we got a good show lined up for you today. Oh, well, I'm a Game of Thrones nut, so that's 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 my jam. The robots are listening. The robots are listening. All right, and welcome to this episode of the Autoconverse podcast, where we explore people, ideas, and technologies that influence how we are connected and the way we get around. I am Ryan Girardi. Great, as always, to be here with you. In the opening sequence, we put forth the idea that there is a conflict between the narrative that EVs, that's electric vehicles, are necessary to save the planet, and the reality that some are really just profiting from the push while not actually helping the planet. Last week, we addressed the impact that EVs have on the scrapping business, particularly with the challenge of what to do about the batteries in electric vehicles and how to properly dispose of and recycle them. Now, today we are going to look at something different that is also affecting many of us, which is why it is so difficult to get your hands on a new car these days. Most likely, if you are shopping for a new car right now, you will not find one on any car lot that you visit, at least not one that you can get your hands on. The days of having hundreds of new cars on a dealership lot are effectively gone. You will find, upon entering a dealership to purchase a vehicle, that there is effectively no inventory from which to choose. And when you are able to get your hands on a vehicle, you must wait months for it to be shipped. And the only way to get one is to place a deposit on an incoming unit. So to understand how the buying process has changed, we first really need to understand how we got into this situation. Today's cars are effectively computers with wheels. Even an inexpensive new car can contain more than 100 or so microchips, powering everything from climate controls to shift timing. Luxury cars, minivans, and vehicles with more advanced entertainment and comfort technologies will use more than 150 chips throughout the car. 
As we know, the chip shortage that resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic was due to the lockdowns when a number of people began working at home, children learning at home, and playing more video games. So chip manufacturers shifted their limited supplies of microchips over to the computer industry. And when the car manufacturers began opening back up, there just was not enough chips for the auto industry. And this is why manufacturing is now being brought back into the U.S. to manufacture chips. Now, arguably, these are not the sole causes of the new vehicle shortages that we're seeing. The supply chain is a complex system, and the problems that we're witnessing really will not be remedied anytime soon. And on top of that, the way we buy a new vehicle will probably never be the same again. Uh, later in today's episode, I will play part of my interview with Mike Columbus. He's a Honda automotive professional who's been on the podcast here a few times. Mike provided most of the information that I just gave you about why we are in this situation. And in my interview with Mike, we talk about what to expect when trying to buy a new car today. But before we get into all that, how about some headlines? All right, to kick things off, California is set to ban the sale of new gas-powered cars by 2035. This is a move that was expected to set the pace for a national and international shift to electric vehicles. As you know, California tends to lead the way on new policy like this in the U.S. and really across the globe. The California Air Resources Board was scheduled late in August to approve the sweeping Advanced Clean Cars 2 Act, that would also gradually phase out gas-powered vehicles in the state over the next dozen years. Under the measure, 35% of vehicles manufactured in 2026 and sold in the state would be required to be zero emission, up from 12% today. The green quotas would increase to 51% in 2028 and 68% in 2030 before being universally applied to all 2035 cars, SUVs, pickups, and truck models. Used vehicles that operate on gasoline would be allowed to stay on the road and be resold. The amendments to the act are consistent with a 2020 executive order from California Governor Gavin Newsom that aimed to quote-unquote put the state on a path to carbon neutrality by 2045. The proposal, they say, will substantially reduce air pollutants that threaten public health and cause climate change. This is the new Hummer, and unlike the old gas-guzzling model of the past, loved by Arnold Schwarzenegger, this one is electric. General Motors is heavily promoting the new Hummer as a zero-emission car, but the claim isn't just misleading, it's actually a big fat lie. There may be no exhaust coming from the back of new Hummer, but the electricity that drives it definitely creates pollution, as most of the energy generated in the US still comes from burning fossil fuels. According to one study, driving the 9,000-pound electric Hummer just one month puts out 341 grams of CO2, which is significantly more than basically every single petrol or diesel-powered sedan sold on the market today, even more than this heavy diesel-powered V8 Audi SUV. So obviously we're going to see more electric vehicles hitting the road over the years. We talked about the S-curve hitting the United States here, where we're uh, crossing over 5% of cars on the road being electric vehicles. And as we talked in last week's episode about the disposal of vehicles today, particularly with electric batteries, well, now the Department of Energy would like feedback on how to recycle lithium ion batteries. It is launching a battery recycling program with $335 million. It took a first step towards launching the new program in the U.S. and it issued a request for information, RFI, to ask for the public to input on how to spend the $335 million in federal investments for battery recycling, which was included in the bipartisan infrastructure law passed last year. Lithium ion batteries used to power electric vehicles and store renewable electricity are a major building block for a clean energy economy and recycling could ease the impending squeeze on materials needed to meet rapidly rising demand for those technologies. Especially as the Biden administration tries to keep the U.S. on track to meet pollution-cutting goals it has agreed to under the Paris Climate Accord. U.S. Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm said in August, battery recycling doesn't just remove harmful waste from our environment, it also strengthens domestic manufacturing by placing used materials back into the supply chain. 
All in all, the bipartisan infrastructure bill invests over $7 billion over five years to build up a domestic battery supply chain. And that includes $335 million for lithium-ion battery recycling programs. The programs are supposed to improve the process of collecting batteries at the end of their lives and harvesting valuable materials from them. Programs also aim to minimize environmental risks from tossing out and rehashing used batteries while also making battery recycling more popular and developing a new workforce for the recycling industry. And on that note, some of the innovations that come out of battery electric vehicles, Toyota and ChargePoint have partnered to offer home and public charging in preparation for the launch of its new BZ4X electric SUV. Toyota has announced it will work with ChargePoint to offer customers home and public EV charging solutions. For home charging, customers will have the option to purchase a ChargePoint Home Flex Level 2 charger from participating Toyota dealerships or directly from ChargePoint. The Home Flex is Energy Star certified and Wi Fi enabled. It can be installed indoors or outside, and it comes with a 23 foot charging cable. Very cool. And not to be outdone on the EV front, Tesla CEO Elon Musk says that the self-driving Tesla could be ready by the end of the year. Yes, after a six-year wait, Musk says he is aiming for the self-driving technology to be released by the end of this year. However, precedent points to the situation being unlikely. In a Reuters report, Musk is quoted as saying, The two technologies I am focused on, trying to ideally get done before the end of the year, are getting our Starship into orbit and then having Tesla cars to be able to do self-driving. Since Musk first announced the idea in 2016, there have been several new releases, release dates each year, which all come short. He even promised a Tesla self-autonomous trip to from New York City to L.A., which got delayed to 2017 then 2018 and is still yet to happen. So it could be worth taking Musk's timeline, a uh, new timeline with a grain of salt. Now, in that quote, you heard Musk mention getting a starship into orbit. As you know, we've been reporting on SpaceX's development of Starlink. Well, T-Mobile and SpaceX now say your 5G phone will be able to connect to satellites next year. T-Mobile says it is getting rid of mobile dead zones thanks to a new partnership with SpaceX's Starlink satellite internet. With their coverage above and beyond setup, mobile phones could connect to satellites and use a slice of a connection providing around 2 to 4 megabits per second across a given coverage area. And that connection should be enough to let you text, send MMS messages, and even use select messaging apps whenever you have a clear view of the sky, even if there is no traditional service available. According to the press release from T-Mobile, the satellite to cellular service will be available everywhere in the continental U.S., Hawaii, parts of Alaska, Puerto Rico, and territorial waters. The service is scheduled to launch in beta by the end of next year in select areas, and eventually someday will include broadband air. And here's something fun. The Biden administration has launched an airline customer service dashboard of passenger rights for canceled or delayed flights. The new dashboard allows passengers to navigate the complex accommodations and reimbursements policies of various U.S. airlines when a flight is canceled or delayed. U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg says passengers deserve transparency and clarity on what to expect from an airline when there is a cancellation or disruption. And this dashboard collects that information in one place so travelers can easily understand their rights, compare airline tickets, and make informed decisions. The project comes weeks after Buttigieg told airline CEOs that the level of flight disruptions this summer has been unacceptable and that airlines must provide timely and responsive customer service during and after periods of flight disruptions. And the agency's recent push for passenger rights has triggered multiple U.S. airlines to significantly alter their existing hotel and meal voucher policies. And this is pretty neat. One million square feet of L.A. roads are being covered with solar reflective paint. 
and the initiative covers roads, playgrounds, and parking lots, and it's already cooled the surface by 10 to 12 degrees. It's no secret by now that cities run hotter than the countryside. Fewer trees mean less shade, and concentrated human activity generates heat, which hard services like pavement and parking lots absorb. So to combat the urban heat island effect, some cities have been retrofitting public buildings into climate shelters, while others have been planting thousands of trees. And one Los Angeles neighborhood is turning to solar reflective paint. The team behind the GAF Cool Community Project has just finished painting a whopping 1 million square feet of roads, playgrounds, and parking lots in Pacoima, California. The paint comes with special additives that reflect infrared light, meaning painted pavement ends up absorbing less heat. Most of the services have been painted a light shade of gray, but a local artist was commissioned to design a series of colorful murals on a basketball court, a school playground, and a parking lot. The initiative comes on the heels of a series of dangerous heat waves in the U.S. affecting more than 16 million Americans. Painting streets may not be the silver bullet that fixes the urban heat island effect, but in Pacoima, it has already cooled the surface by about 10 to 12 degrees, highlighting the potential for a simple yet effective upgrade. And last but not least, there are a few uh, recalls to cover. Ford has recalled over 277,000 trucks and cars due to rear camera lens issues, particularly becoming cloudy, affecting driver visibility while reversing. And Ford, by far, continues to lead all other manufacturers in recalls across the country this year. The recall impacts the 2017 to 2020 model years of the Ford F250, 350, and 450 pickup truck models, plus the Lincoln Continental sedan, which all have a 360 degree camera lens attached. In addition to this, Ford also recalls 198,000 Expedition and Lincoln Navigator SUVs over a fire risk, possibly originating from the front blower motor. Ford has not yet identified an exact cause of the problem, but it is aware of 25 allegations of vehicle fires in Expeditions and Navigators from the 2015 to 2017 model years. So what's next? Well, the affected vehicles will have their blower motors replaced with a revised setup. Of the 198,482 affected vehicles, more than 163,000 are Expeditions and over 35,000 are Navigators, again, all from the 2015 to 2017 model years. And one final recall, GM's Cruise recalls and updates software in 80 robo-taxis following a recent crash. Cruise, the autonomous vehicle unit under GM, reported a software recall and update in 80 of its robo-taxis following the crash in June. The crash, which resulted in minor injuries to two riders, received national attention because it occurred a day after Cruise received the final permit from California regulators to commercialize its driverless robo-taxi service. Cruz said in a regulatory filing with the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration that the software recall was issued because of a rare circumstance in which the automated driving system caused the driverless robo-taxi, which did not have a human safety driver behind the wheel, to hard brake while making an unprotected left turn. Cruz said in an email statement that it submitted the voluntary filing in the interest of transparency to the public and added that it pertains to a prior version of software and does not impact or change its current on-road operations. Speaking of recalls, if you go to autoconverse.com, uh, you will soon be able to sign up and access our Slack workspace that we've set up for the blog. And in that workspace is a channel for vehicle recalls. And we will make a point to keep a pulse on some of the recalls affecting uh, cars of the future, such as EVs and autonomous vehicles and other major recalls as well. Coming up. It says, hey, Mike, um, I was told you are the guy to look for for a new car. I thought, great. And he says, uh, I'm looking for a Toyota Corolla. Great. Do you happen to work tonight? Great, I sure do. He says, good. I'd love to stop out and see what you have. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't have anything for him, and I had to educate him about the current buying process, which is taking a deposit on a future uh, car that would be built and come in.
The following health and wellness tip is brought to you by Ask Auto. There's no such thing as good or bad posture. There is such a thing as being in a posture for too long, which could be bad for you. So that usual posture of us rounded head forward, if you're staying in that posture for a long period of time, that is bad for you, but the posture itself is not inherently bad or good. Um, so that's just to get people out of that mindset. The three tips I have for posture today are gonna be more based around general movement than here's a really specific exercise that you can do. The first actual tip, the best thing you can do for your posture is just get up and move and take frequent movement breaks, right? The question always is how frequent and about 20 minutes is the ideal. Getting up every 20 minutes and moving is pretty much impossible for most people. So start with every hour. The second part of that is, well, now that you got up, what do you do? Your body doesn't know the difference between an exercise and going to get a glass of water. Mm -hmm. It's movement. So as long as you move in a variety of ways. And the last part is gonna be really kind of out of left field here, and that's the 20-20-20 rule. So the 20-20-20 rule states that about every 20 minutes, going back to the taking a break, you should look at a distance of 20 plus feet for 20 seconds. So 20, 20, 20. Now this is actually for the muscles of your eyes. We look at our computers, our phones, books, food, all of it is within arm's reach. Mm -hmm. So everything is up close. Allowing those muscles to relax by looking further away gives you that reprieve so you're not having that eye fatigue and eye strain that people get for months and years of office work. That was Stefan Zavalin from B2B Hour on Auto Conversion, our company blog and website, not to be confused with autoconverse.com, our mobility tech and connectivity blog and podcast that you are listening to right now. Stefan consults on the use of physical movement and work environment to reduce stress and chronic discomfort and promote healthier workplace habits to improve longevity. You can visit him on the web by going to www.stefanzavalin.com. That's S-T-E-F-A-N-Z-A-V-A-L-I-N.com. Hey, Dad, are you still looking for a car? Did you know that when you click on car ads, dealers pay for every click? But shouldn't you get paid? After all, you're the one clicking. That's why I use Ask Auto. With Ask Auto, you build rewards as you shop. Plus, Ask Auto recommends exclusive offers based on your needs. You can ask questions on cars you like and still protect your personal information. You can even set your price. Who knew car shopping could be so easy and rewarding? Ask Auto, fast, fun, and rewarding car shopping. All right, let's get into my interview with Mike Columbus about buying a car today. As we talked about, if you're shopping for a car, you're not likely to find what you want on the lots. You're going to have to go through an order process. You'll need to do most of your research online. So websites like Kelly Blue Book, Edmunds, and Consumer Reports will give you an idea of the products and the brands that, you'll, that will meet your needs. Of course, having the guidance of an automotive sales professional is invaluable as well. Say hello to Mike Columbus, who actually helped me prepare much of this information and was our featured guest last month on our live show. So first, you're going to want to determine a few things like the type of vehicle that you want, obviously, what features are important, fuel efficiency, and what type of car. Do you want gas-powered or electric, knowing that gas-powered vehicles are starting to get phased out already? But knowing these things, you can begin to research the vehicles that are being manufactured and then decide which meets your needs. In fact, you just heard an ad from our sponsor, Ask Auto, which uses machine learning and artificial intelligence to gather information about your preferences and then helps you locate vehicles that match your, criteri your criteria. Now remember, just because a manufacturer advertises that they have a product, reality may be it is not even being built. Additionally, exterior, exterior color selections are limited and interior color selections are, are even more restrictive. But once you know the vehicle and the features you want, you'll need to find a dealer that can review these trim levels, the colors, and most importantly, the availability. 
And typically, you will find availability divided into three categories. Number one is going to be vehicles that have been built and are in transit to the dealership, meaning they're on their way. Two would be vehicles that have that have a to-be-built date. And then the third would be vehicles that must be allocated, vehicles that the dealership requests a manufacturer to build. And then from there, you just need a little bit of patience. Vehicles that have been built and are waiting to be delivered can still take several weeks or even months to arrive. There's also an ongoing truck driver shortage, and dealerships are at the mercy of truckers delivering the vehicles when they're able to do that. Now, the second category would be vehicles that have a to-be-built date. These are dependent on the supply chain to have all the parts available to build the vehicle. These vehicles seriously could be four to eight months before arriving at a local dealership. And vehicles that fall into the third category are ones that we, that we request a manufacturer to build. These are typically colors that are not readily available or a vehicle with a high microchip count. And these could take eight months to a year or more to arrive. So if you're looking for a good deal, the best possible factor is finding a dealer that does not add a market adjustment price increase to their vehicles. Because yes, there are dealerships that are marking up vehicles anywhere from two to even $10,000 over MSRP. And almost all auto buying discount, discount programs have effectively ceased, making buying at MSRP a pretty good deal. And then finally, you need to place a deposit on the incoming unit. So I don't need to get into this. Let me play my, uh, let me play my interview here with Mike. So you can, and he, he'll actually walk us through this process in its entirety. Well, let's talk about that. If, let's talk about right now. If I want to buy a car, what is this? What can I expect to go through from from beginning to end? Am I gonna? Obviously, I'm gonna go up to the web. I think people are. We've been doing that for 20 years. We're going to the web. We're, we're searching Google usually. Uh, but let's walk through the process. What is really gonna happen? What's What's the first part of that journey for a shopper? Well, if they're going onto a dealer's uh lot they're not going to find product for sure uh, especially if they're looking to see differences in trim levels differences in colors uh, if they're looking to test drive it's just not going to happen so if i had a product that was a late model perhaps it's a current generation of what they're looking for uh, and i have something pre-owned that they can drive that's what we're going to do uh, if not i'm just going to have to assure them that they can place a deposit on one that is being built give them an estimated time of arrival. Um, then when the vehicle comes in, they have first rights of refusal. They can test drive the vehicle, determine if they like it, if they want it, and then move from there to purchasing it. Okay, so I can get any car I want. I just have to put a deposit and order it and then just wait a couple of days or a couple of weeks? It depends on the trim level, the color, uh, the options selected. Um, so I... Uh, continually update every day a manifest of what's coming in this month. Uh, there might be three or four products that are available that no one has put a deposit on. Usually those aren't the most sought after vehicles, but I do have a list of those. After that, it would be those with a future build date. So um, I, I'm looking at my August, September build dates and then uh, looking for a delivery date of six to eight weeks after the product is built. Six to eight weeks. So I can yeah. build it on the manufacturer's website. That's pretty standard, right? That's standard, but that doesn't get it into the queue of purchasing it. So it has to be allocated through a dealership. And then the manufacturer has to pick up the order, which is essentially them saying, okay, we're going to build this car. And then we'll get an estimated build date. And you say six to eight weeks is typical right now? Typical after the vehicle is built, yes. Oh, after it's built. And that's just because so of I could shipping and logistics. Shipping and uh, supply chain. Mm -hmm. So I could have a, uh, a build date of, let's say, September 10th. That doesn't mean it's going to be built on September 10th. It means that that's the projected build date if we have all the supplies necessary to build the vehicle. If the vehicle is built on the 10th, uh, then it would be six to eight weeks after it was built. Okay, so let's let's take a step back and just address why we're in this situation. I think it's easy to say, oh, COVID just COVID changed. This is this all about COVID. Can you explain why we're even in this situation? And then we'll go into why it'll never go back to where, where it was before. 
Well, to answer your first part of the question, uh, COVID played a major part in the situation we currently are facing. Um, dealerships closed, manufacturers closed around the March of 2020. Uh, the supply chain then uh, stopped with regard to manufacturers receiving product, especially the microchips. Uh, so everyone was home. They were on the, their computers. They were buying computers. They were playing games. They were doing educational um, uh, lessons and schooling on their computers. So the microprocessor manufacturers shifted to the computer industry for the microchips. And uh, when the automobile factories opened back up, there wasn't the chips to supply the, their needs. How many chips does it does a typical car need these days? I mean, we call them a computer on wheels. Do they just need one? Or are we talk, how many chips are we talking about that a car needs? We're talking into the hundreds. And so it varies depending on the vehicle. Um, a minivan, for example, could have 150, 200 chips. That's necessary for all the doors, and all the features in a minivan. Uh, less equipped uh, vehicles require less chips, of course, but uh, everyone is suffering from shortages and every manufacturer is handling the shortages differently. Uh, I had a customer that purchased a um, Silverado, it's a $60,000 truck, and it came without the chips for the heated seats. And so they were told they would have to wait at least two years before there were chips available for the heated seats. And is that something that uh, you could bring your car back two years later and get addressed? Or get that's, chips yes, for? that's what's going to be. Yes. So okay, so you could actually stranded. you could actually get a car, drive it around for a period of time, just lacking certain microchips. Correct. Yes. So yeah. the the 2022 Honda Civic, when it was coming out, was when it first came out, was coming with one key fob, with a promise of uh, a second key fob at a later date. Depends on really what the chip is that's that's needed and. and what the manufacturer wants to do to help the customer in that regard. Okay. So you got three, basically three scenarios, vehicles that have been built and are already in transit. Those you can, but those are probably already have a deposit on already claimed at this stage, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. So then the other option is, is you build your car and order it and you put a deposit on it. What kind of de deposit are we talking about? Our dealership is only requiring a $500 deposit. Uh, other other uh, local dealerships are requiring a, a one $2,000 deposit. And okay. ours is completely refundable. We're not holding deposits. Okay. So it's a serious deposit. It's not like just, you know, 100 bucks or so. Right. Okay. And then you have vehicles that still need to be allocated. Uh, these are... These are cars that no one's custom built, but the dealership is, re is basically ordering. Well, an allocation request would be would be the next step. And that's where we would say we want this particular vehicle. Let's say, for example, I took a deposit two months ago for the Type R that's coming out, on the Civic Type R. Uh, we have an allocation request for that vehicle, but it hasn't been picked up yet by Honda, the manufacturer. Picked up meaning, okay, we, we acknowledge you want this vehicle. We are going to build it on this date. Okay, well, that's a wrap. Thanks again for tuning in to this episode of the Auto Converse podcast. If you haven't already, be sure to text the keyword Auto Converse to 855-766-7585. We will send you a link to get subscribed to our YouTube channel so you can tune into the live shows. We'll also send you links to occasional videos that pop up and special bonus episodes from the podcast. Dogecoin right now seems stuck at just over six cents a coin, which is a long way down from this time a year ago when the coin was at about 30 cents each. And just a few months before that, I think it was up close to 70 cents. Right now, it's down about 6% from this time a week ago. So if you are a Doge holder, well, to the moon. Keep hanging in there. Take care, everyone. We will see you next week, and I hope you have a wonderful Labor Day weekend. 
Ciao. This is Audiburst Media.